I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Chad Williams. He's Dean Samuel J. and Augustus Spector, Professor of History and African and American Studies at Brandeis University. He specializes in African American and modern United States history, African American military history, the World War I era, and African American intellectual history. His first book, Thoughts Bearers of Democracy, African American Soldiers in the World War I Era, won the 2011 Liberty Legacy Foundation Award from the Organization of American Historians, the 2011 Distinguished, Distinguished Book Award from the Society for Military History, and was designated as a 2011 Choice Outstanding Academic Title. He's co-editor of Charleston Syllabus, Readings on Race, Racism, and Racial Violence, as well as Major Problems in African American History, second edition. <coughs> he has widely published and has earned fellowships from various institutions, and he is currently completing a study of W.E.B. Du Bois and World War I, and his title is W.E.B. Du Bois and the Wounded World, Reckoning with the History and Memory of World War I. Thank you very much, Claire, for that introduction. Thank you, everyone, for being here this afternoon. I want to thank all the conference uh, organizers and Anop for your uh, very generous invitation uh, to travel across the Atlantic uh, to be here. Well worth it. Um, it's been a, a pleasure and an honor. Uh, so this afternoon, I am going to tell a story. It's a story about war and the challenges of being African American. It's a story about race and democracy, about history and memory. It's a story about hope and disillusionment, about optimism and tragedy. It's a story that spans almost two decades, from one world war to the next, and features as its central character. He's coming, trust me. There he is. <laughs> William Edward Burkhardt Du Bois. The context of this story is World War I and its legacy. The focus of this story is a book, a book that Du Bois spent much of the interwar period laboring to write, a book on the black experience in the First World War. It was to be the definitive history of the subject and one of his most significant works of scholarship. He gave it a remarkable title, The Black Man and the Wounded World. He never finished the book. What happened? Why did Du Bois try to write this book? What was it about? Why did he spend so much time working on it? Why did it remain incomplete and ultimately unpublished? Why is it even important? What does it reveal about Du Bois and his complicated relationship to World War I? What does it potentially reveal about our world today? So as best I can, in the time that I have, let me tell you an abbreviated version of W.B. Du Bois and the Wounded World. Du Bois closely followed the World War from the opening guns of August of 1914. Yet, in a very real sense, Africa is the prime cause of this terrible overturning of civilization which we have lived to see. He wrote in his landmark 1915 Atlantic Monthly article, The African Roots of War. He pinpointed the origins of the conflict in the competition amongst the European belligerents for imperial control of Africa and its people. France, England, and Belgium all had blood on their hands. But thirsty for global domination, Germany, in Du Bois's opinion, posed a grave threat to the world's darker races. He would throw his lot with the Allies. So when the United States entered the war in April of 1917, kind of late, but you know, what can I say? Du Bois, unlike many of his socialist friends in and outside of the NAACP, was not opposed. He argued that it presented an opportunity for African Americans to stake claim to their citizenship and bring meaning to Woodrow Wilson's claim that the world must be made safe for democracy. Black people had fought in the past, and now they would do so again, with hopes that the two warring ideals of being black and being American that Du Bois famously articulated in the souls of black folk would at last be reconciled. Du Bois threw himself into the war effort, encouraging 
African Americans as soldiers and civilians to demonstrate their loyalty on and off the battlefield. But white supremacy tested his patriotism. Along with other African Americans, he had to reckon with moments like the unjust execution of 13 soldiers following a racial shootout in Houston, Texas, and especially the East St. Louis pogrom of July 1917, which left hundreds of black people dead. While African Americans certainly pleaded for Woodrow Wilson to make America safe for democracy, they also demanded, as evidenced by the sign of protest parade in response to the East St. Louis pogrom with the boys, actually, Wait a out here, marching in the front, cane in hand. And shout out to Megan Mink Francis, who uses a different image from this parade in her brilliant book, Civil Rights and the Making of the Modern State. So when Joel Spinger, one of Du Bois' best friends, former chairman of the NAACP, approached him in early June of 1918 with an offer to become a captain in the War Department's Military Intelligence Division. He had a momentous, potentially career-defining choice to make. Du Bois knew that this appointment would arouse suspicions, but he believed, as he wrote in a letter to the director of the Military Intelligence Division, his decision to accept the offer reflected in his words, no inconsistency with or change of attitude from my lifelong work and opinions. Indeed, he viewed his attitude as, quote, one of far-reaching patriotism. But, just to be sure there are no lingering reservations about his loyalty, he wrote close ranks for the July issue of The Crisis. The Great War represented the crisis of the world, Du Bois began. He argued that, however distant the war seemed, black people had, quote, no ordinary interest in the outcome. For this reason, African Americans had to make their allegiances clear. Let us, while this war lasts, forget our special grievances and close our ranks shoulder to shoulder with our own white fellow citizens and the allied nations that are fighting for democracy, Du Bois declared. We make no ordinary sacrifice, but we make it gladly and willingly with our eyes lifted to the hills. Close ranks unleashed a firestorm of controversy and criticism. The Boston civil rights activist and one-time ally of Du Bois, William Monroe Trotter, labeled Du Bois, among other insults, quote, a rank quitter of the fight for rights. From coast to coast, in newspapers and barbershops, many African Americans branded Du Bois as self-serving at best and at worst, a traitor to the race. For a man who had committed his life to the cause of freedom and justice for black people, no charge could be more damning. The captaincy offer ultimately crumbled, but the uproar and damage to his racial and radical credentials left Du Bois deeply scarred. Du Bois' attempt to strike a grand bargain with the federal government and with American democracy seemed yet more misguided in light of the U.S. military's treatment of black servicemen. Approximately 380,000 African-American soldiers served in the racially segregated U.S. Army. The majority of black troops in France unglamorously labored in the services of supply, loading and unloading ships, digging ditches, laying railroad tracks, and burying dead bodies. The Army reluctantly agreed to the creation of two black combat units, the 92nd Division, composed of draftees, and the 93rd Division, made up largely of black National Guardsmen. While the 93rd Division compiled a stellar combat record, the 92nd Division became, as Du Bois later described it, the storm center of the Negro troops. Racist white commanders and deliberate neglect from the War Department doomed the performance of the division from the start. While its black officers, Du Bois' shining examples of talented 10th manhood and racial leadership, endured humiliation after humiliation. African Americans can certainly point to several notable battlefield triumphs and moments of racial pride, like the famous 369 Harlem Hellfighters. But for most black soldiers, the war for democracy that Du Bois had so enthusiastically championed evolved into a personal hell. As the end of the war neared, 
voice, his credibility tattered, his leadership in question, set in arguably the most precarious position of his otherwise illustrious career. Then, quite unexpectedly, an opportunity presented itself, one that would profoundly impact Du Bois's life for the next two decades. At the October 1918 Board of Directors meeting, the NAACP proposed that Du Bois spearhead production of a book on the history of the black experience in the war. He leapt at the opportunity. The scholar in Du Bois was intrigued, but more important, here was a chance for redemption. As a way of demonstrating his continued ability to organize and to lead, he initially hoped that the book would be a collaborative effort. And here comes the connection to the previous presentations. He had two co-authors in mind, the first being Ian Carter G. Woodson, founder of the Association for the Study of Negro Life in History, the second potential co-author, Emmett J. Scott, former secretary to Booker T. Washington, who had recently served as a special assistant to the Secretary of War. But Du Bois's influence had its limits. Woodson, arguably the most prominent African-American historian in the nation, next to Du Bois, insisted on receiving sole credit for the project. Scott, arguably the most influential African-American in the government during the war, had plans to write his own book. At stake was the right to call oneself the historian of the black experience in the war and the leadership stature that went along with it. This was a, a fight that Du Bois had to win. Undaunted, he set his sights on France, where, as he would later write, the destinies of mankind center. On December 1st, 1918, Du Bois departed from Hoboken, New Jersey, as part of the official press delegation accompanying President Woodrow Wilson to the peace conference at Versailles. And there's a lot of intrigue at how he got to France, how he got his passport. Maybe if we have time, we can talk about that later. Du Bois spent three months in France. He organized the landmark Pan-African Congress in February 1919. His principal mission, however, was to conduct research for the NAACP war history. He toured the battlefields. He saw the trenches where soldiers of the 92nd Division fought until the 11th hour of November the 11th as the armistice went into effect. He visited the encampments and experienced, as he recalled, a touch of war. Most important, he talked with black soldiers and officers. With military intelligence following his every move, Du Bois absorbed tale after tale of discrimination, slander, and abuse inflicted upon black servicemen at the hands of the American army. A longtime friend, Virgil Boutet, served as his guide. Boutet was a captain in the 92nd Division who had been constantly humiliated by his fellow white officers, court-martialed on false charges of inefficiency, seriously injured in combat and placed in spite of his officer status in a segregated hospital ward with regular enlisted men. He entrusted his diary to Du Bois, where in one painful entry he scrawled, no nation on earth has ever hated a group as the Americans hate Negroes. Never in my life have I heard such an astounding series of stories. Du Bois wrote from France in a January 1919 letter to his NAACP <coughs> colleagues. He knew what needed to be done. The task ahead for Du Bois was clear. His commitment had been sealed. I can say solemnly and without hesitation, he declared, the greatest and most pressing and most important work for the NAACP is the collection, writing, and publication of the history of the Negro troops in France. Du Bois returned to the United States, enraged, embarrassed, and determined. He cannot help but to question if his decision to encourage black people to throw body and soul into the war effort had been worthwhile. He channeled his frustrations along with the anguish of the African-American servicemen he encountered in France into the post-war issues of the crisis. In the May 1919 issue, he informed readers about his mission in France, exposed the racism of the U.S. Army, and defended the honor of black troops. The highlight, however, was returning soldiers, as his words would serve as a rallying cry for African-Americans 
in the aftermath of the war. We return. We return from fighting. We return fighting. History would be Du Bois's central battlefront in the struggle over the meaning of the war. Most American Negroes do not realize that the imperative duty of the moment is to fix in history the status of our Negro troops. He wrote in an editorial announcing his plans to produce the study of the black experience in the war. To assist in this cause, he tasked readers of the crisis to, in his words, help in the compilation of this history. Elsewhere, he specifically asked black soldiers and officers to, quote, see that the editor of the crisis receives documents, diaries, and information such as will enable the crisis history of the war to be complete, true, and unanswerable. Letters, diaries, photographs, official military documents, and personal memoirs quickly flooded Du Bois' office. In a note to Du Bois detailing his battles with racism while serving overseas, Sergeant Charles Isom of the 92nd Division expressed his pleasure that, quote, someone has the nerve and backbone to tell the public the unvarnished facts concerning the injustice, discrimination, and Southern prejudice practices by the white Americans against the black Americans in France. Du Bois promised that his book, which he tentatively titled The Negro in the Revolution of the 20th Century, would appear by the fall. Black veterans like Charles Isom hoped that Du Bois would tell their story. Du Bois intended to serve as their muse. Generating further excitement in the June 1919 issue of The Crisis, Du Bois published an essay toward a history of the black man in the Great War, a tantalizing preview of the larger book he planned to write, and a preemptive strike of sorts against attempts to distort and marginalize African Americans in the history and memory of the war. He wrote, there's not a black soldier, but who was glad he went, glad to fight for France, the only real white democracy. <laughs> Interesting. Glad to have a new, clear vision of the real inner spirit of American prejudice. The day of camouflage is past. Du Bois' certainty would be severely tested throughout the summer of 1919. From Washington, D.C., to Chicago, to Lane, Arkansas, race riots and full-scale massacres exploded throughout the country. The number of lynchings skyrocketed. Black veterans found themselves quite literally fighting for their lives. James Weldon Johnson labeled these bloody months the Red Summer. The horror of the summer was seared into, Bo into Du Bois' memory, as he would remember 1919 as a year of, in his words, extraordinary and unexpected reaction. Du Bois used his 1920 book, Dark Water, to reflect on the war, its appalling aftermath, and his growing disillusion. He minced no words. In the chapter, The Souls of White Folk, Du Bois wrote, Oh, let me say this again and emphasize it and leave no room for mistaken meaning. The World War was primarily the jealous and avarice struggle for the largest share in exploiting darker races. Du Bois also asked a remarkable question. How great a failure, and a failure in what, does the World War betoken? On both a personal and intellectual level, it was a question that he had to answer. Du Bois therefore committed himself to the NAACP war project. He devoted significant time throughout much of 1920 and into 1922 to drafting potential chapters for what he confidently believed would be the definitive history of the black experience in the war. Still exhilarated from his Pan-African Congresses of 1919 and 1921, he wrote chapters on the experiences of black troops in the French and British armies, as well as a chapter musing on the future of the black world in the wake of the war. Du Bois's early chapter drafts also reflected an attempt to try and find redemptive value in the global catastrophe and his own place in it. This was clear in a chapter which he titled The Challenge, which summarized the difficult choices African Americans and himself faced in supporting the war. For a moment, and it was but a moment, it passed. But for a moment, the country seemed to rise to its mightiest stature, he wrote. Addressing his disillusionment, he mused, I've been called bitter. I am bitter. 
But here I saw all the hurts, the tears, the pain, as in one country, and that country was mine. <laughs> du Bois was glad that at least for this one brief, fleeting, emancipatory moment, he could call himself an American, that he and the race could think with the nation and not as a mere group. We could rise to mighty selfishness, the nation, our country, the allies as champions of the little hurt folk. The only way he could explain his delusion was to plead temporary insanity. We were mad. That is the only word for it. We were mad. And let it not excuse us to say that the madness was divine. But he still refused to completely admit that he was wrong. How in the end did all this set with our inner problem, he pondered. After all, it was not a mere bargain. It was a moving Du Bois pressed ahead to finish his book. He held out hope that despite a lack of financial support and numerous other commitments and distractions, future book projects, crisis editorials, speaking engagements, Pan-African Congresses, a venomous feud with Marcus Garvey, it would soon be completed. But the worsening conditions facing African Americans and peoples of African descent throughout the diaspora caused him to further struggle with the war's individual and collective meaning. The walls of caste segregation seemed to only grow higher. Racial violence became more and more horrific. The grip of Europe on Africa, in spite of its Pan-African Congresses, only tightened. And then there was personal tragedy. In January of 1922, Du Bois lost one of his closest friends and the man who best embodied the quest to reconcile, you can see the picture here, race and country, Colonel Charles Young. Young was the highest ranking black officer in the army during the war and black America's military hero. He had been unjustly retired from active service during the war for dubious health reasons to prevent him from becoming <coughs> ill. It broke his heart. The army reinstated him after the armistice <coughs> and assigned him to Liberia. He would die in a Nigerian hospital. Over a year after his death, Young's body was finally returned to the United States and buried with full honors in Arlington National Cemetery. But Du Bois could not forgive the government for what he described as the inexcusable crime of sending Young to Liberia. These are Du Bois' words. For if Charles Young's blood pressure was too high for him to go to France, why was it not too high for him to be sent to the even more arduous duty in the swamps of West Africa? God rest his sickened soul, the boys concluded, but give our souls no rest if we let the truth concerning him droop overlaid with lies. This ugly reminder of the war's legacy provided further validation for the new title the boys had given his book by this time, The Black Man and the Wounded World. As the title reflected, Du Bois' initial conceptualization of the war as a potentially revolutionary moment in the reconstruction of global race relations had evolved into an interpretation of the conflict as one of the darkest moments in modern world history. The war was a global tragedy. The sense of the war as tragic was not solely about the incredible loss of life and physical destruction. For Du Bois, it also had to do with the strengthening of white supremacy and continued economic exploitation of peoples of African descent. No surprise then, that he described the war in the opening chapter of his book manuscript as a scourge, an evil, a retrogression to barbarism, a waste, a wholesale murder. Du Bois's public announcement in 1924 of The Black Man and the Wounded World sparked renewed public interest in his book. Encouraged, he began writing again. This is the actual table of contents from his manuscript. By 1926, he had drafted the bulk of his envisioned chapters. The book, finally, seemed on the verge of completion, but he needed help. He had a massive manuscript that, judged by his high scholarly and artistic standards, still required significant work. Without time and editorial assistance, he felt that he could not justly complete the project. Seeking support, he sent inquiries to nearly every major philanthropic organization, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Russell Sage Foundation, the Slater Fund, the Carnegie Endowment. All expressed courtesy interest, but all ultimately offered their regrets. But beyond the practical obstacle of financial support, 
Du Bois faced an even bigger and more daunting challenge himself. If the war he had supported was indeed a failure, as he pondered as early as 1920, with no positive outcome, then perhaps his book, Languishing and in Limbo, was destined for a similar fate. Du Bois's sizable ego would not allow for this possibility. As he agonized over what to do with his book, many of the same veterans who had once viewed Du Bois as a savior now grew restless and requested the return of their personal letters, photographs, memoirs, and other ephemera they had loaned him many years ago. Du Bois rebuffed most of these requests. Du Bois may not have felt guilty about his truly ungracious treatment of some of these black veterans, but he certainly harbored guilt about his decision to support the war. In 1930, Du Bois participated in a published discussion for the magazine The World Tomorrow on the war guilt debate. If Germany was solely responsible for the war and if American intervention was justified. In his reply to the editor, he admitted to being swept off my feet during the World War by the emotional response of America to what seemed to be a great call to duty. The cost had been immeasurably high. Instead of a war to end war or a war to save democracy, we found ourselves during and after the war descending to the meanest and most sordid of selfish actions. And we find ourselves today nearer, nearer moral bankruptcy than we were in 1914. Then surprisingly, but with somewhat of a disclaimer, he admitted, I'm ashamed of my own lack of foresight. And yet war is so tremendous and terrible a thing that only those who actually experience it can know its real meaning. Du Bois was willing to acknowledge his error in supporting the war, but still sought to rationalize his decision by casting himself as one of the war's countless victims. It was not his fault. Never content to remain unproductive, Du Bois turned to other projects, including his most notable published work of history, Black Reconstruction. The war, however, stayed on his mind. In a letter to Alfred Halcourt, proposing Black Reconstruction in 1931, Du Bois informed the editor, quote, I'm going to add next year as a second volume, The Black Man and the Wounded World. That is the part which Negro troops took in the World War and its significance for the world today. Harcourt responded to Du Bois that the proposed study on Reconstruction, quote, promises a really interesting book. He made no mention, however, of the book on the World War. Following the 1935 publication of Black Reconstruction, Du Bois again returned to the black man and the wounded world. A glimmer of hope appeared in March of that year when he secured a $600 grant from the Social Science Research Council. By this time, Du Bois' politics had moved further to the left, and he began to envision the black man and the wounded world as an explicit lesson in the horrors of modern warfare. A trip around the world in 1936 brought even greater clarity to the book's new significance. Thanks to a fellowship from the Oberlander Trust, Du Bois spent seven controversial months abroad. First, visiting Hitler's Germany, then England, France, Switzerland, Austria, Russia, China, uh, excuse me, China, and finally, Imperial Japan. He returned to the United States in December of 1936, having seen firsthand the seeds of the next world war. The need for his book could not have been more urgent. This was the moment. He needed people to see that the still open wounds from the last world war, infected and festering, promised an even greater disaster in the near future. In his mind, it was now or never. Hoping to finally put the project and along with the memory of the war itself behind him, Du Bois reached out to the American Philosophical Society in March of 1937. I began my work in this field as a conventional study of the Negro as a soldier in the World War, he wrote. But over time, the whole theme has been expanding and developing in my mind, more especially since my trip around the world in 1936. He now conceived the book on a much broader and more important scale, his words. If only he could have leisure and opportunity to finish this work, Du Bois pleaded. I think I can do something which will have influence on future knowledge with regard to war and colored people. He thought that about $7,500 would be sufficient. 
The American Philosophical Society denied his request. With this final rejection, Du Bois, disheartened, grudgingly abandoned hope that he would finish and publish his book. Despite an investment of almost 20 years, despite a manuscript nearly 800 pages in length, the black man in the wounded world, Du Bois' epic history of the black experience in the First World War, would never see the light of day. So this could very well be the end of the story. But we are left with the question of why. Why didn't Du Bois finish the black man in the wounded world? I argue, I argue that Du Bois suffered from almost a type of intellectual shell shock when it came to writing about and rationalizing a war defined by its irrationality. In his semi-autobiographical 1940 book, Dusk of Dawn, he wrote, in my effort to reconstruct in memory my thought in the fight of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People during the World War, I have difficulty in thinking clearly. Du Bois, <laughs> difficulty in thinking clearly? Really? He would go on to lament that the whole history of the American Negro has never been written. He recalled his time in France and the mass of documents that he collected over the years. They deserve publication, not simply as part of the Negro's history, but as an unforgettable lesson in the spiritual lesions, spiritual lesions of race conflict during a critical period of American history. By the 1940s, it was clear that the spiritual lesions left on the world by the First World War had not healed. Du Bois' own wounds had not fully healed either. In a 1941 letter regarding his alma mater, Fisk University, possibly taking a position of support for American entry into World War II, Du Bois wrote, quote, I have lived through one period of deliberate and prolonged, um, excuse me, prolonged, um, prolonged propaganda for war and partially succumbed, succumbed to it until I really believed that the First World War was a war to end war and that the interests of colored people in particular were bound up in the defeat of Germany. I have lived to know better, and my opposition to war under any circumstances has been immeasurably increased. But even up to the final years of his life, the boy still sought to understand why he had supported the war in the first place. I felt for a moment as the war progressed that I could be without reservation a patriotic American. I'm not sure, he would go on to write, that I was right, but certainly my intentions were. I did not believe in war, but I thought that in a fight with America against militarism and for democracy, we would be fighting for the emancipation of the Negro race. With the armistice came disillusion. That disillusion stayed with Du Bois until his death on August 23, 1963, in Accra, Ghana. The war consumed Du Bois. It confounded him not make sense of it as both a personal and historical moment. He was unable to muster the intellectual fortitude and, dare I say, even the moral strength necessary to complete his book. His failure, if you want to be so bold to use that word, embodied the tragedy of the war he struggled to write about. In this sense, the black man in the wounded world was Du Bois himself. But we are also left with the question of why does this story even matter? The easy answer is, well, it's Du Bois, and anything about Du Bois matters, of course. But I believe that this story goes beyond Du Bois and reveals to us the impact of World War I on African Americans, how it exposed the core tensions of African American identity, and how it shaped the history of racial struggle in the 20th century. For Du Bois, the history of World War I was not simply an intellectual challenge. It was a profoundly personal, moral, and ethical challenge as well. It still is. Du Bois understood that the history of the war was deeply bound with the political status of black people, the future of democracy, and the condition of the world we live in. It still is. So as we ask ourselves over 100 years later, what was the significance of the war? What did it all mean? Why is it worth remembering? Du Bois and the black experience reminds us that these questions are not just academic. They are critical in 2019 to confronting our still flawed democracies, and necessary to try to heal our still wounded world. Thank you.